Good evening and welcome to this edition of History in Highballs as part of the North Carolina Museum of History's History at Home Initiative. We're so glad that you're joining us for this evening's special History and Mocktails program, Decorating Biltmore. My name is Stacy, and I handle adult education at the museum and I'm so glad that you're, you've chosen to spend your evening with us, listening to some incredible stories about North Carolina places and people and what makes our state so special. Tonight's program is just one of many exciting digital offerings available through MOH. So if you'd like to learn more, we invite you to head over to the museum's website at www.ncmuseumofhistory.org. We would like to take this opportunity to thank our North Carolina Museum of History Associates and Foundation for making tonight's program happen. Our Associates and Foundation provide crucial funding and support to the museum, which in addition to many other things, helps make programming like this evening's event possible. If you'd like to learn more about becoming an associates member, please head over to their website at www.ncmoha.com. We would also like to take this opportunity to thank those of you who graci graciously donated funds towards this evening's program. We do our best to keep our programs free to attend, but there are costs associated with keeping these series going, and we continue to be so appreciative of your generous support of the museum. Uh, if you haven't already used the link in your registration email to check out the tutorial for this evening's specially themed mocktail, The Holiday Punch, with special guest bartender Mike Beavers of Mingle Bars, we invite you to make use of that link and head over to the museum's YouTube channel and check it out. It is delicious and sure to put you in the holiday spirit. A few quick housekeeping items for this evening. We ask that you please keep your mics muted throughout the entirety of the event and to please type any questions that you have for our speaker into the chat function located at the bottom center of your screen. At the end of the program, I will ask the speaker as many of your questions as time allows. And we've already had a few folks uh, share where they're viewing from tonight, but please continue to let us know what state you're watching from. Uh, welcome to those of you from Kentucky, Virginia, Ohio, and Arizona, and of course, North Carolina. Uh, so it is my delight to introduce this evening's speaker, Lizzie Borchers, Floral Displays, Displays Manager for Biltmore House and Gardens. A Texas native, Borcher, Borchers studied um, floriculture at Texas A&M &M University with the dream of someday working at Biltmore. After working at Delphinium Designs and Events, one of the largest florist shops in Texas, she joined Biltmore in 2014 as Lodging and Events Floral Manager and she became the Floral display, Displays Manager in July of 2017. The museum is decorated. I've got my Jingle Bell earrings on, so we are ready to get in the holiday spirit. Lizzie, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Welcome. Thank you so much. I appreciate um, just the opportunity to get to be here with you guys tonight. I know it's kind of a strange way to um, give a presentation. Um, go Aggies, I see we've got one there. Um, but, uh, you know, I just love this platform to be able to um, share with people from all over the place. I, I, love, um, I love that um, uh, this is being offered. Um, so just uh, again, thank you for being here tonight. I know this has been an unusual year um, at Biltmore. We've definitely, um, you know, the state was closed down for a couple months earlier this year. And when we came back, um, number one priority was Christmas and um, figuring out what that would look like for, this, for us this year. Um, it was not just an unusual year because of everything going on in the country and the pandemic, but um, uh, for us, Biltmore celebrating our 125th anniversary of Christmas on the estate. And um, uh, sorry, I'm gonna start sharing a presentation here as I get going, share my screen. Um, So um, 1895 is when um, George first opened Biltmore House to his friends and family. So that 125 years ago um, was what was happening. So I'm gonna start my presentation just by helping, just to paint the picture of what was happening at Biltmore State 125 years ago. Um, let me just get my control going here. All right. So construction on Biltmore had been going on for six years, taking hundreds of men. It took an army of tradesmen, um, 
brick makers, stone carvers, landscape designers. There was a rail line even built straight to the front lawn of the house in order to bring supplies and that Indiana limestone. And you can see in this top picture, as with any big project, it makes quite a mess. Um, so when George moved into the house as it was coming to completion on October 26th in 1895, there were still um, just a lot of loose ends. Um, but his immediately, um, his priority and his focus was getting the house ready um, for a large house party for his um, family on Christmas. So with all the help that he had surrounding him, he had his superintendent, Charles McNamee. His first request was to clean up the front lawn, um, get all signs of construction cleared away, um, remove all the fences. Um, the only things that did remain was the rail line um, and the fence running alongside of it. Um, George also enlisted the help of Chauncey Beadle, who taken over the horticulture operations from Friedrich Law Olmsted, who designed the gardens for the house. Um, that entailed um, decorating the house for Christmas. Um, they gathered barrels of mistletoe, wagon loads of holly, um, draping the house and, and decorating it. Um, there you see the front door, which I like to imagine being open to greet um, those first guests coming for Christmas. Um, like I said, there were still some things unfinished. This is the winter garden in Biltmore House and that statue called Boy Stealing Goose um, carved by Carl Bitter had arrived but had not yet been installed in the winter garden. Um, there were rooms that were yet unfinished. The music room was not, not quite done. Um, but again, all that was kind of put on hold in anticipation of Christmas and to get ready for that. One thing George knew he needed was a Christmas tree um, and Chauncey Beadle agreed that even just a 20 foot tree was gonna look pretty dwarfed in the banquet hall, which you see here. Um, George called for a tree that would reach halfway to the ceiling and the ceiling in the banquet hall is 70 feet high. So that meant a 35 foot tall Christmas tree. Um, we do know that there were a few people who offered up trees from their yards. Everyone kind of knew there was a buzz going on about what George was doing here in Asheville in the mountains um, and people were willing to help and um, they were offering up their trees. We don't ultimately know where that first tree came from, um, but we know it was grand. Um, other requests that George made to get ready was he needed um, firewood for his mini fireplaces. There are 65 in the house. The largest being in the library, um, the banquet hall itself has a series of three, but he wanted um, firewood in five foot lengths. Um, you have large fireplaces, you need large firewood. Um, we also have archival documentation of all the food that was being ordered in. Um, fish was ordered daily. Um, he called for lobster for 50 people twice a week and with a two week long um, house party, that means 200 lobsters. Um, he ordered black walnuts, chestnuts, celery, honey, fruit, and eggs, um, and even brought in domestic staff since he had not yet built up um, the household staff that it would take to um, run such a large estate. Finally, um, George's guests arrived. The first crowd came on Christmas Eve itself. They arrived via a special five car train to passenger station in Biltmore Village. The gathering included George's mother, his siblings, their spouses, and many um, nieces and nephews. It was actually the largest gathering of the Vanderbilt family since George's father passed away. The painting that you see there um, was in George's family's home on Fifth Avenue in New York City. You see his father sitting there um, to the far left, and George is actually the young boy who is looking straight at the painter. These trees you see here are also um, in the second floor living hall, which is actually um, just off of this hall is where that um, original painting does still hang today. Um, and I would also just like to share um, all this photography of the trees that you are seeing are actually the trees that are up in the house right now. We often um, uh, 
use previous year's photography um, when um, sharing about Christmas, but I did want to share with you um, what's actually up in the house right now. So these trees that you're seeing um, are lit and being viewed this evening. Um, the family having arrived there Christmas Eve dined sumptuously in the banquet hall. Uh, George's niece Gertrude is the picture that you see there. She was 20 years old at the time and very caught up in all things uh, social. Her social world was her world. Um, and she kept a diary of seating arrangements at different dinners and menus. Um, and she did write about the dinner that they had this evening, noting that it was her 193rd formal dinner of the year. So she had quite the social calendar. Um, but her notes do also tell us that there were 27 in attendance, like I said, the largest family gathering since George's father's death. Um, the Imperial Trio was a musical group from the Kenilworth Inn, um, which was a very popular spot and it is um, still here in Asheville. That musical group came over and performed English Christmas carols um, all during their dinner there in the banquet hall and then um, followed the party into the tapestry gallery um, where they continued playing. The group returned again the next evening on Christmas um, to play again and then again actually on New Year's Eve. Um, those trees that you see there on the right, that is the tapestry gallery and they were designed this year around um, a musical theme because of that story that we know that um, that is where the family enjoyed um, their mu music on Christmas Eve. Uh, the next day on Christmas itself, all the employees on the estate were invited by invitation to the banquet hall um, in Biltmore House for a Christmas celebration. Um, Christmas Day, George was opening his doors wide to over 200 um, employees and guests who were greeted initially with a speech from George. Um, and then uh, the tree itself gave up its uh, gift laden branches and George's mother um, and his siblings helped distribute gifts and everybody received something. Um, uh, the really special thing about that morning was um, every employee's child received a personally selected toy. Toys included wagons, dolls, to uh, tool chests, Noah's Arks, rattles, drums, tea sets. Um, and the party continued on there in the banquet hall. Um, when they finished in there, they actually moved next door to the stable complex, um, which had been laid with uh, fruits and ices and the party just continued. They moved it from the banquet hall out there and um, really had an um, incredible day of celebrating. Um, in the days that followed, um, beyond George's family, there were additional guests and friends that um, continued to arrive and all were, of course, in awe of uh, this house that George had built. Um, they spent their time golfing, um, playing foursome, uh, dancing, walking, quail shooting, um, and just enjoying the indoor pastimes that the house was designed um, to offer. There you see on the left, uh, the billiard room. George was of course a bachelor when he built this house. So um, there's a pretty extensive uh, bachelor's wing including a billiard room, a smoking room and a gun room. Um, and then of course, enjoying the bowling alley which is down in the basement. Um, I just kind of imagine this time period as being such a perfect celebration. I think every year we do always think back to those early Christmases at Biltmore, but this year particularly, um, we definitely reflected back to that and um, let it influence our decorating. So just to kind of talk now more about uh, what that looks like today and what um, the preparations that we undertake to decorate Biltmore House. Um, it definitely means so much to me that it continues to be such a special time at Biltmore and uh, uh, definitely such an honor to be a part of it. Uh, that first Christmas was, as you heard, a big team effort. There were many people involved to make it happen, and that is certainly the case today. Our floral team um, is responsible for decorating um, the trees in the house, but we do not do it without the help from our horticulture team, our engineering team, housekeeping, um, and our host department. 
we began our preparations really the year before. Um, in fact, just this week um, on Tuesday, we did our annual walkthrough, which is really our time where our floral team goes through the house and um, we stop in each room. It's our time to admire and appreciate the work that we've done, um, but then it's the time when each designer on our floral team will get to select which rooms that they want to decorate for next year. Um, that room there on the left, Mr. Vanderbilt's bedroom, that was designed by Christy this year. And so um, this week she had the chance to decide if she wanted to decorate it again next year or let another designer take it. Um, Mr. Vanderbilt's bedroom um, is connected via the oak sitting room um, to um, Mrs. Vanderbilt's bedroom, which you see here. Um, again, George was a bachelor. And so this, uh, he did anticipate that he would have a wife one day and so had built this room, um, which became uh, Edith Stuyvesant Dresser, um, who became Edith uh, Vanderbilt. Um, and I think if there's something really special, I think she um, just really rose to the occasion um, and uh, continued some traditions that George began with that first Christmas party and giving gifts to all the employees. There on the right, you see a gift wrapping table that we set up every year. Um, we know that uh, Edith turned one of the tower bedrooms in Beltmore House into really her little elf workshop every year. Uh, she personally would select uh, Christmas gifts for all those children and she kept a thorough record so that um, no child received something that they might have gotten the year before. Um, you see there um, enlarged um, the FAO Schwartz receipt list that we do have in our archives um, listing many of those uh, toys and items that she purchased. Um, and I will just with that add that um, that is something that the family who still own Biltmore Estate um, have continued to this day. They still um, individually select Christmas presents for all the children of all the employees, um, which is a lot more than that 200 that it was back then. And, um, you know, as an employee, that's something I just think is very special and appreciate that they um, have valued that tradition. Um, so each year we do design all of our rooms around a theme. Um, this year we really kind of wanted to go back to the basics, not just because um, of COVID and us just feeling like that was really important, but um, like I said, with the anniversary year, just to give you a little preview, next year we will be designing around a Christmas carols theme, which we're all very excited about. Um, each room going to be themed around a different Christmas carol. Um, and we don't know if uh, George had a tree in every single room. There were um, 45 guest bedrooms, and so that would be a lot of trees. We do think George liked the best of the best, and if he was here today, we like to think that he um, would approve of how we have decorated his house and um, continue to offer that hospitality and opening it up to um, so many to come and enjoy the year. And if you have not been, I definitely um, uh, welcome you um, uh, to make it over to Asheville if you can sometime. Um, these bedrooms, uh, this one that you see here is the Louis uh, 15th bedroom. Um, this is kind of a special room. It is actually where Cornelia Vanderbilt was born, um, where Edith uh, gave birth to her. And then subsequently, uh, Cornelia gave birth to both of her two sons um, in this room as well. So it is a very special room um, uh, to the house and to the family. Um, here you see the morning salon tree and uh, the breakfast room tree. Um, uh, it does take, uh, there are, the number of trees in the house does vary year to year. Um, usually anywhere from 50 to 60, sometimes closer to 70 trees. Um, they do range in size from a, a small tabletop size tree that would be in one of the smaller guest bedrooms to, of course, that 35 foot tree in the banquet hall. Our design process really does take um, 
about a month of actual install, even though that prep work continues uh, year round, we start decorating um, kind of the beginning of October, um, all through that month, um, candlelight um, Christmas at Biltmore does start usually the beginning of November. We start with the upper floors decorating um, uh, up on the fourth floor is where some of the servants' bedrooms are and we decorate those spaces. Um, uh, also from the basement and kind of then we work from our top, the top down, the final, the last tree to come in is that banquet hall tree. Um, but we really do pride ourselves on our attention to detail. Um, I have often challenged somebody to find a crooked ornament on any of our trees. Um, it definitely can be tricky sometimes, but we take the care to make sure everything is hanging perfectly straight. Um, we design from the inside out. Um, I mean, larger ornaments are going deeper into the trees. Longer finials may be on outer branches and that may be kind of adjusting and tweaking the branches so that those ornaments can hang perfectly straight. Um, our ribbon and bows are such an important part of our decor. Um, there are so many different materials that you see, um, uh, mixed metals, velvet, satins, um, silks, and um, I really feel like that is oftentimes for me the finishing touch to the tree. Um, there's at least seven different kinds of bows we even use. Um, our whole team goes through um, bow training on just how to make different types of bows, whether they're graduated um, loops or uh, a, a classic two loop bow or the different kind that you would use to put onto a tree topper. Um, uh, we uh, take such great care even with that ribbon, um, steaming it and ironing it um, as we do use a lot of our materials year to year, even though each year we do also add to our inventory. Um, like I said, that last tree to come into Biltmore House is always that um, Frasier fir in uh, the banquet hall. And uh, tree raising day is really a particularly special day at Biltmore. And just to share kind of a little bit about that process, which is definitely something that we have refined over the years. Um, our tree arrives on a wagon and um, out on the front lawn of Biltmore House, we have a 60-foot Norway spruce, um, which actually takes a crane to install. And of course, we cannot bring a crane into Biltmore House, so it does take pure manpower to, um, to raise that tree. Uh, lifting it off of the wagon requires 50 men. Um, and we put poles through the tree to actually lift it up and get it through the front door, where it then gets laid down on... Um, basically a giant skateboard. Um, prior to that, even though uh, the house has to be prepared for its arrival, um, the path from the front door around the winter garden to the banquet hall has to be cleared, which means moving um, some very um, precious furniture, including our entry hall table um, and some chests that are along the morning salon hallway. Um, as the tree comes through, uh, uh, that pathway getting to the inter the banquet hall itself and um, getting through that doorway. I've never seen it come through without some major cracking of branches that definitely um, uh, makes me cringe a little bit because I think of it as my tree and I don't want those branches to break. But um, coming into the banquet hall and that picture you see on the left, we do have a custom made stand which um, the base of the tree will be anchored in. It is braced to the wall, so it cannot kick out. Um, and while it is then on the floor, four ropes are attached to it, which are uh, guided up to four pulling teams that would um, go up to the organ loft. The tree topper is added before it's, the tree is raised itself. Um, the star that you see there in that picture um, was really special. We actually, we do make a different tree topper every year. Um, this year we did that Bethlehem star and had it custom made by our carpentry team. We had actually ordered one and bought one um, and it came in and we just decided it, it wasn't big enough and it didn't look good enough and didn't meet our standards. So we had one custom made um, and that is that Bethlehem star you see. Um, 
As you see there, there are animal heads and a very large chandelier, and that is one of our little challenges for getting that tree um, raised up. But um, as it swings around that chandelier, we have a really um, skilled team that really works together to get it up. Um, and once it's raised, it is secured. And then our team um, swoops in and um, starts decorating. And even to do that, we have a special method using poles that have a nail on the end. Every single ornament, if you go through the house um, and look at the banquet hall tree, has the hook on it has a loop in the center of the wire, which that nail on our poles is able to go through can lift the ornament up and pull the nail out of the loop in the wire and let the ornament drop and hang on the branch. Um, we do use scaffolding and we decorate from up in the organ loft as well, but um, decorating a 35 foot tree is definitely uh, different than a small one in the living room. Um, then the base of the tree is finished off with gifts and fruit and um, all that we do just to continue telling that story of the history of that first Christmas um, uh, with George and um, giving those gifts out to uh, his friends and family. Um, then once that tree is done, the final finishing touches that we add to the house are fresh poinsettias, which are grown by our horticulture team here in our greenhouses. Um, adding amaryllis that they also grow, uh, fresh plants, fresh arrangements. We do, our team goes cutting on Biltmore Estate every week. Um, so we are not even just buying um, all that greenery that we use in arrangements. It is coming from, from the property um, and we design and place in the house weekly. Uh, we have fresh wreaths and garlands um, and swags that we replace every other week, um, not just throughout the house, but also across the property. Um, once we are done decorating Biltmore House, there are about 55 other trees across the estate um, that we then move on to decorate. And that includes um, in both our, um, our inn, hotel, the winery, um, restaurants, uh, our ticket center. So um, it's definitely quite a process. And, um, you know, just to, uh, share more about kind of what that looks like because you know uh, um, there's definitely questions that I get a lot about where all that gets stored. It all does uh, go off property to a um, warehouse where we um, uh, begin the process to plan for next year, um, sorting those ornaments, um, decorating new garlands. Um, like I said, we do add to our inventory every year, but we never um, we never use it the same things the same way twice. So an ornament that you might have seen in the library um, may be used in a bedroom the next year or something that was in the entry hall may be um, used uh, in the music room. Um, so we definitely uh, like to give a different experience every time anyone goes through um, the house itself. So. Um, I do hope that if you haven't been able to visit that you um, do get that chance. Um, it's definitely a, an amazing place. Um, I, um, uh, I love getting to uh, share and talk about both our um, process, the design process, as well as just the history. Um, you know, we always say that everything that we do is just to enhance Biltmore House. We never want to um, overshadow it, um, but we're here to, to tell a story and to shine light on the history um, and the legacy that George has left by creating Biltmore House. Um, and I know we just uh, had said that we'd have the chance to answer questions and I'm happy to answer any of those now. Thank you so much, Lizzie. That was so wonderful to see the trees, especially for those of us who aren't able to make it up to Asheville this year. Uh, we have so many questions for you, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, let's see here. I will get through as many of these as we can. Um, I think you touched on this, but the first one is, uh, when does decorating begin at Biltmore and how long does it take to complete? Yes, so like I said, decorating will, in a sense, 
goes all out during, during the summer. Um, but when we actually are installing the first trees in the house, really actually kind of ends up being the end of September. There is a row of suites, the uh, Louis suites, which is the damask bedroom, Claude, Tyrolean, and Louis. And we kind of get a head start on those because those rooms are closed during the summer. There's a lot of heat that comes from on that uh, south side of the house. And so to protect those rooms, they are closed and another um, row of suites is open and it's placed on our tour route. And so we get a head start there. Um, and then, like I said, it does take an entire month to, uh, to start beginning to end in the house and then beyond that, the rest of the estate. An enormous undertaking, <laughs> clearly. <laughs> Uh, our next question is, is there a lead designer for your decorations? Is that you? Um, that is me. I do actually I, um, meet with every single designer individually, um, talk through their design plan, help uh, make suggestions. If there's something they're thinking about doing that um, doesn't quite suit Biltmore House, might say, hey, we're going to take it a different direction. Um, or why don't we think about this? Um, or what are you going to need specifically to execute that. So that is um, every every design uh, for each room does have to get approved and that is through me and that's just to make sure that overall the big picture is um, a cohesive experience. Um, are any of the Christmas decorations or dolls original? Um, we do not unfortunately have any um, original ornaments or decor. Um, sadly as fragile as those um, things can be. Um, they've just not stood the test of time. Um, we do have a lot of actual old elements that we use, um, both vases and containers um, that we design arrangements in, um, as well as different toys that get put under the trees. Uh, and though those are antique, they are um, not necessarily from what we call collection. If something's collection, that means it is from the Vanderbilt um, legacy. Um, we do have some elements that we do use that are collection, different collection containers. Um, we have a process, we work very closely with our museum services department um, to determine what we are allowed to use or not allowed to use. Our entire team does go through object handling. We do go through some pretty specific training um, in order to work in the house. We do actually get asked a lot if we take volunteers and that really is the primary reason that we do not just because the level of training that we require in order to be behind the ropes around the collection, possibly moving items. Um, so that is always a priority of just that preservation and care um, for the house. Um, do you, and I think you touched on this as well, but do you reuse old ornaments and where are the decorations stored after the holidays are over? Yes, like I said, we have a large off property warehouse. Um, Biltmore House is big, but we have a lot of decor too. And so we never want to you know, use up that space with um, storage. There are a few things that we do leave in the house. Um, we definitely have to use our space very well. Um, if when you're going through the house and you see a door that's shut and locked, but look under the um, kick of the door and if you see a little bit of marble, that is likely a bathroom. And we do use a lot of bathrooms and closets in the house um, to store different items. So at the start of our install season, we have what we call box day. And that is when we bring in all the boxes of ornaments and decor from our off property warehouse. We get it all into the house and um, it, they get stashed in different areas depending on which room they're for. Um, so if it's um, ornaments that are, gonna, are going to go in the damask bedroom, we put those in the closet off of that bedroom. So um, once the house is open, which we do decorate while the house is open. So if you tour the home um, in the month of October, you are likely to see us decorating them, which I think is you know, kind of a fun little bonus to see the in progress um, before the finished product. Um, but yes, it does. Just the logistics of it all is quite, quite an operation. I can imagine. Uh, so this kind of, kind of, uh, is on the heels of that. How long does it take to dismantle <laughs> and, um, take care of storing all those ornaments? Yeah. So that actually takes a lot less time. 
we can actually get the whole house undecorated in about a week. So compared to a month, it definitely goes so much faster. Um, and a lot of that is just because when it's going up, we're taking such care to make sure everything is perfect. Um, and not to say we don't take care when everything comes down because we do individually wrap every ornament, um, but it does, it just goes a lot, a lot quicker. Uh, how many floral designers do you have? How many total people on the floral staff contribute to these decorations? Um, as of now, we have 12 on our team, which thinking about close to 100 trees, um, it's, uh, just, I'll just say I'm really proud of them and, and the work that we put in. And, and then, like I said, yes, each one of those designers is responsible um, for a certain number of rooms and areas to decorate. I can imagine that that is many, many trees <laughs> for a small amount of staff. Yes, um, do you we know, have help. <laughs> <laughs> thank God. Uh, do you know if George, excuse me, and his wife uh, actually traveled to FAO Schwartz to buy the toys for the children or if they ordered them? Um, that's a great question. I, I do assume that since they did have a home in New York City that I'm sure they did go there. Um, but based on some of these receipts, I think that there was ordering involved. That's not to say that they didn't actually go as well. Um, I think George did like to personally pick things out just in building the house itself. He did a lot of travels just to gather furnishings. Um, we know he um, traveled abroad to Europe collecting paintings and furniture and rugs. So I wouldn't be surprised if they personally went to FAO Schwartz. That's so incredible. Um, lots and lots of questions about the trees. <laughs> um, yeah, sorry, I'm seeing some of these. I know I did see something about asking about- Are they live? And last where do they come from? Live. Yeah, so um, all the fresh trees that we have on the estate do come from Andrew's Nursery. Um, it's a local family there in uh, uh, Newland, North Carolina in Avery County and uh, Biltmore has built just a good relationship with our family over the years and um, they've been supplying us with our trees for a very, very long time. Um, Greg Andrews there who we work with, his father before him actually worked with the company. So um, uh, we do have kind of some specifications that we make about our trees. We ask for our trees to be unsheared. Oftentimes Christmas trees have been cut to be a very triangular shape and uh, we want more of a natural shape um, so our live trees are unsheared. They are also sprayed with an anti-desiccant, which does um, help preserve the life of them. That banquet hall tree is not in water. It is just set straight on a wood board. Um, really a tree that large, a little bit of water that it may drink from a pan isn't gonna make a difference in its lifespan. Um, really a tree that size is about 30 years old um, and the amount of water that it can just retain as it comes in. If we've had a really rainy year, often our trees are heavier. Um, but again, with the preservation in mind, uh, and since the tree comes in so early, like I said, the beginning of November, usually the end of um, October, we do actually switch that tree out mid-season. Um, so earlier in December, kind of the first week, we um, take that tree down and we put up another one. Um, which again, that in and of itself, just taking it down is a process. We do kind of um, uh, cut the tree apart and take it out um, before bringing in the fresh one. Um, and again, another um, just preservation measure that we have is, um, you know, no, notoriously um, Christmas trees can be a fire hazard. So we actually have um, seven smoke detectors that are within that tree that are hung wrapped in different Christmas ornaments and in gift packages. Um, and then we actually have a water tank that is in the Oregon loft that could douse the entire tree should there be an emergency. And granted, knock on wood, we have never you know, encountered that. And we really switch that tree out before it gets too dry. Um, but we like to cover all the bases because um, you know, Biltmore House is, is more important. Wow, that's incredible. Um... Yeah, so many people are interested in how you keep the trees looking fresh for so long. <laughs> yes, now, like I said, that anti-desiccant on those, um, 
Many of the trees in the rooms themselves are not fresh. We kind of have a combination of both. Um, but all the, all the fresh garland, fresh wreaths, fresh swags. Um, the roping down the staircase, we actually switch out weekly. Um, fresh wreaths, we switch out every other week. So they are constantly fresh. Um, uh, the, this year particularly, we kind of changed up the roping that we typically do down the staircase and we actually did swags instead. And those did entirely come from the estate. So they are about as fresh as can be since we just you know, walked out back and uh, cut all that greenery, the holly, um, evergreens. That's so wonderful. Uh, lots of uh, questions about the decorations and the ornament. Um, what, any idea what the oldest ornament that you guys have currently is? Um, we do have some very old wax ornaments. Um, if you're familiar with um, kind of that older style of um, using a wax mold and, and uh, painted painted wax ornaments and uh, they don't necessarily go up every year, but they're something that we still hold on to. Um, there's definitely a lot of different um, styles of old ornaments uh, that we still have. We have a lot of even uh, things that are handmade by the team. If there's, uh, even if it's a, an ornament that we have bought, but it's not quite exactly what we want, um, we will hand paint them, um, add embellishments, do what it takes to really have um, the exact look that we're trying to, trying to accomplish. A uh, question about the decorations, ornaments uh, particular, are they inventoried? And if so, uh, how do you keep track of them all in that inventory system? Yes, it, it's, it's a challenge. Um, you know, and especially we, we break a few every year. So I, I, we don't have necessarily an exact um, record of how many of everything we have, but all of our boxes are labeled on the end um, with, if not, an actual photograph of what's inside that box, um, at least a very, very thorough description of, of, of what we have. And you know, sometimes that description can be um, six inch elongated finials with gold stripes and, you know, as descriptive as we can get, um, we want to make sure that we know what we have because it is quite a bit but we every year have what we call we call it our shopping day um, which we literally take all of the ornaments that we own everything in our inventory we have them unpacked and in piles and we lay it across the floor of our warehouse and it just really covers the whole the whole floor of the warehouse and that is kind of how we keep everything fair and even among our designers to make sure everyone gets the ornaments that they're needing and wanting for their designs. And we kind of walk through um, in an organized fashion to, to kind of claim what everyone wants for their different rooms each year. Um, are the trees and the bedrooms color coordinated with the bedroom decor? That is a really great question because I know I was um, uh, mentioning earlier how we design around a theme. Um, and so really, you know, the theme kind of first off is one, um, I guess, guiding factor in designing the, the, the decor, but um, the room is also a huge factor. Um, so taking inspiration from uh, the wallpaper, the fabric and the bedspreads. Um, an example would be that Louis bedroom uh, that you saw. We, we, selected some very specific ribbon um, to complement the Harlequin style pattern on the tassels on the curtains in that room. Um, so the room is definitely um, dictating and a consideration in putting that together. Um, you know, we don't have, back to the fact of George being a bachelor when he built this house there, it, it's a beautiful, stunning home, but there's not a lot of super feminine rooms. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. Vanderbilt's bedroom, the music room, morning salon. Um, you know, we, I, I just think the house is so unique in that um, there's just such a variety of looks um, within, uh, within the house to decorate to. And um, 
you know, I think that gives their designers a unique challenge in and of itself to um, take inspiration from the space. I really challenge everyone a lot to just go and stand in the room. And sometimes that's the start of the design process is just stand in the room for a while and look around and just start noticing different things. Um, even every time I go into the house and um, I see different things and um, uh, different things jump out at you and um, can inspire you. And you can really design an entire Christmas tree around the smallest of details um, and build a whole look. I can imagine it's a very inspirational place to be every day. <laughs> yes, you know, I always say that I'm so lucky to do what I do where I get to do it. Um, and it, it doesn't get old and um, definitely don't take it for granted. And um, yeah, it's, it's pretty special. And I think it just anyone who comes to visit and you know, builds their own Christmas traditions there or walks through that house and I'm sure there are thousands who have walked through it with uh, the thought that we all have of just imagining if we lived there, or we got to come stay there, or if it was your own home, what that would be like. And um, I'm in it every day and I still do that. Um, in addition to Biltmore and the Breakers in Newport, Rhode Island, do you know if the Vanderbilts have other mansions that are currently open to the public? Um, as far as, you know, like I said earlier, George Vanderbilt's families uh, today are who still own Biltmore House. Um, uh, the, the mansions in Newport, I do, you know, those are for sure other Vanderbilt homes. They weren't necessarily George's, they were his family, but um, there's nothing else that's from George's specific family that, that I know of that's open apart from uh, those Newport mansions. He did have a home, I know, in um, Washington, D.C. Um, at one point, they are, the family had an apartment in Paris. Um, and uh, the, the Fifth Avenue home, I know, doesn't exist anymore. So I, th I think really in light of that, that makes Biltmore all the more special um, that it does exist and that it is open and um, available for us to visit. It's, it's really kind of a gift. Absolutely. Uh, so going along that vein, uh, we have a couple of questions about the family. Um, do they, you know, participate and or visit the house during the holidays? Uh, and does any of the family reside there today? Um, nobody lives in Biltmore House itself. Um, many of the family do live on the property. You know, what was originally a 125,000 acre estate is now just 8,000 acres of state, but that is still um, very large, and so they are there, but they are very um, present, active um, uh, part of the company. I mean, uh, they're very invested. We see them regularly. Um, uh, they sometimes actually help decorate for Christmas, so um, that even happened this year, so it's definitely, um, uh, they're definitely very present and involved, um, uh, for sure, and I think you know, even as their generations continue on, our, you know, our current CEO and his, um, the next generation are starting to kind of step into um, leadership roles within the company. And um, it's definitely something that they um, you know, made a family thing and continue on. Uh, any accidents and or damaged museum items while installing all these gorgeous trees? Um, there's, there's always little things. There's, um, as far as major incidents, uh, not so much. It's probably more as just breaking ornaments. There's always ornament casualties. Um, like I said, we are very specifically trained, but any, any little incident, um, does go through a process with the company. We do incident reports all the time, and that's not always necessarily to, um, you know, sometimes it's just to prevent something that could happen in the future. If it's a near miss, um, say, you know what, this was a little too close. Um, uh, we were very conscious of um, how we carry things through the house. Um, we use a lot of carts so that we don't um, have any issues with dropping things. Um, and the way we uh, 
anything that we set on furniture, we have a lot of different protective layers and barriers that we put between that arrangement or plant that's going to have water in it um, and that furniture. So um, uh, everyone's, even if it's just something like a drop of water that lands on some furniture, that's often involves an incident report. Um, or if something leaks out the bottom of a planter, um, you know, we, we want to stay on top of anything that could definitely um, compromise the collection. Uh, do you know if the, the decor at Biltmore uh, started off in all at once decorating so many rooms or if it's sort of built over time? Um, it's definitely built over time. Um, my predecessor, when I stepped into my role, I was taking over for Kathy Barnhart, who um, she really was the first person to start doing uh, Christmas at Biltmore. And she was there for almost 40 years. So um, when she started, at, actually at that time, Biltmore used to close during the winter months. It didn't even used to be open for Christmas. And so um, it was William Cecil, who was Cornelia's son, who really um, took a huge, uh, um, really invested of himself in, in painted a vision as to what um, Biltmore would become and what it is now. Um, his priority was the preservation and care of Biltmore. Um, he used to say, we make a profit to preserve Biltmore. We don't preserve Biltmore to make a profit. Um, so um, yeah, in those early days, I think there were a lot of handmade ornaments, um, smaller trees, um, many rooms that didn't even have trees. So um, it's definitely kind of gradually grown from there. Um, and I will even say that this year being such a unique year, we had a lot of considerations to make. I won't, I won't say that we scaled it back because I think you would visit Biltmore right now and would never guess, but there were things that we made intentional decisions on this year, particularly to both um, save on our time, but also to create and allow social distancing. We do normally have a tree under the grand staircase, and we did not do that this year just because that is a large traffic area, and we wanted to make sure that could flow um, well during the season. So um, there were definitely some, some big decisions that were made this year um, around, around the decor. Uh, so this one is for you. What is your favorite room in the house to decorate and why? Do you have a favorite? <laughs> uh, two. Um, when I stepped into my position, the very first room I did, I did the banquet hall. Um, and that was um, kind of daunting. It was a lot, you know, um, but I think that that makes it definitely very special to me. I think there's something so special about the fact that it's the room that we know the most specific details about the history of Christmas being celebrated there. So that is for sure um, one of my favorite rooms to decorate. Um, my favorite bedroom is the Madonna bedroom. Um, and I, I can't even really tell you why. It's, it's kind of the room that I think I would like to stay in if I was the guest in the house. Um, uh, but there, there are so many. I really love the third floor living hall as well. To me, that's kind of the coziest space and it's where I definitely most kind of can paint a picture for myself of imagining the family um, kind of cozied up in there, having a more intimate Christmas celebration um, or where you'd wanna curl up with a book and read. Um, so yeah, so didn't have one, had three, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. I can't even imagine how many I would have if I worked there. Um, a quick question about the banquet hall. Are meals ever served in there anymore for any occasion? Do you know? Um, the last celebration that I do know actually happened in the banquet hall was in actually 1995, which was the 100th anniversary. Um, the family did have a large private celebration where they used the room. Um, but with preservation in mind, there's there's definitely um, uh, kind of a big ban on, on on food. I think you can bring water bottles in, but other than that, we don't um, don't allow food in the house. Um, uh, 
we've done, you know, different photo shoots and things where the, you know, the family have used the house for that purpose, but um, uh, that, that um, big 100th anniversary, I think, is the last um, party party that was ever in the banquet hall. We did a, a two springs ago have a Vanderbilt house party exhibit that we did. Um, and that's actually the last time the banquet hall table was fully set. Um, just moving and handling all of that collection china, we tried to do it very rarely, if ever. So the banquet hall table does not usually have a full setting of china. There's um, just a lot involved in that. And that was actually done just a couple years ago. And that was pretty special. Uh, speaking of the spring, we've had quite a few questions. Folks wondering if y'all are still planning on having the Festival of Flowers in the spring, given the current conditions. Um, we are. Um, we, um, uh, it has that kind of morphed from Festival of Flowers. We now call it Biltmore Blooms, but it is still the same event. Um, and as of now, we are still planning on that. And we're you know, talking about that now. We kind of take that little break once Christmas is up and before we take it down to really start the conversation about that. So we are looking ahead to spring and, um, you know, I know this past spring, spring kind of didn't really happen. We, we did a lot of um, sharing of our gardens virtually, but um, we're hoping that this year it, it can come back. Uh, our final question, how long are the holiday decorations up? When can people visit and see the holiday decor before it's taken down? So our um, last night of candlelight is going to be on January 9th. And then our last day of Christmas at Biltmore is January 10th. And we will start taking everything down on January 11th, um, which, um, like I said, those, those evening times, um, I think are a really special time to come. If you come in the evenings, that's when we have candles lit, the fireplace is on, there's live music throughout the house, um, you know, the decor is obviously, the house is decorated all day long, but those evenings are definitely special. So never fear, guys, you still have time. You can get up there <laughs> and mm -hmm. have your normal traditions at Biltmore. Sure. Um, thank you so much, Lizzie, for this awesome behind the scenes look into decorating Biltmore for Christmas, past and present. Um, I'm personally obsessed with Biltmore, so this was really cool uh, to learn about the history of holiday celebrations and decor there. Um, and thank you to all those of you who joined us tonight. Uh, from all of us at the museum, we wish you and your loved ones a happy and healthy holiday season filled with joy and peace. Uh, take care and we will see you in the new year for brand new History and Highballs programs. Good night, everybody. Thank Be you. Well. Good night. <laughs>